In an industry stuffed with marketing bullshit, empty promises, and shiny suited liars, one woman's had enough. She knows what it's like to have the wrong clients, no money, and no time for fun. But she also knows how to fix it. And on the Business for Superheroes show, she promises to tell the down and dirty truth about business, sales, and running away with the circus. Here's your host, Vicki Fraser. Hello and welcome to the Business for Superheroes show. I'm Vicki Fraser and this is Joe. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm all right. But if anybody ever edits this audio podcast, could they remove all of my sniffs? Because I've got a bit of a cold. Don't sniff, it's gross. Well, if somebody gets their editing right, I won't sniff. <gasps> There's a challenge to the podfly, guys. Podfly. Remove all sniffs. Thank you. <laughs> I think you should leave the sniffs in podfly because then... Actually, no, don't. It's gross. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so today, we're drinking beer. Chin chin. What? You're drinking beer. I'm drinking beer. I don't have a beer. No, you're being punished because you went for a beer on the way home. And I thought that you had fallen off a wall and died. I very rarely do that. <laughs> Anyway, we are talking this week about how the universe doesn't give a shit about you. Does not give one small shit. Not one small shit. Because, and what prompted this was all of the news recently about big tax dodging evil capitalist pig dog corporations like Amazon and Starbucks and Google's been in the news as well, haven't they? Yes. Yeah. There's just come to some kind of deal with the British... HMRC to kind of, well, we won't calculate your real tax. We'll just accept a big check and make it all go away. So what's all that? Because you listen to more of the radio than I do. So so there's a theory that Google should actually pay one bazillion dollars on their income from <laughs> UK, whatever the hell it is that Google makes money from. AdWords, I guess. One yeah, bazillion. bazillion. Okay. And Google have so many lawyers that... HMRC has just kind of decided to roll over and have its belly tickled and has just kind of said, well, you know what, we'll just take a few million quid off you and call it quits. Is that is that true, though? Is it actually true? That's what the media wants me to think. Yeah, but is it? Is that just the Daily Mail and Jeremy Vine? Well, I... I, I... Other shit media is available. <laughs> um, I don't think so, given that I don't read the mail or listen to... The fine gentleman known as Jeremy Vine. Oh, he's like the Daily Mail radio version. Have well, you heard the people that phone into his show? Well, if you keep people Okay, like, the people who phone into his show are well, kind of like the people to moan about in this podcast, <clears throat> basically. Because whilst there is a lot of bitching and moaning about the morals and ethics of these big companies, and, you know, I think really probably they should pay a little bit more tax, possibly a lot more tax, the point is... That ultimately these companies are beholden to their shareholders. And not only that, but they are legally obliged to maximise their profits. Legally obliged. That was, was, what was that court case? Was it it like the Daimler Brothers or something? Daimler Brothers in the States. They decided that uh, publicly traded companies were in fact classed as a person and they had to... They have, yeah, legally obliged. Oh, I'm going to have to look that up. I'm, I'm giving my blank face here, yeah, listeners, because I don't know what he's on I about. Think, I think it's something to do with the Daimler brothers and possibly one of them saying we should be more charitable and give poor people cars. And the other one said, no, we shouldn't. Uh, something like that. So, something to do with being charitable with the cars. And they decided that because it was publicly owned, they didn't have the right to make that decision. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to look that up because that's interesting. And that yeah. opens a whole different kind of worms. And also gets me thinking about the moral obligations of people generally and whether and whether society would work better if it were charities that helped people out instead of instead of taxes. Anyway, that's a whole different wormhole. To... Sli- slightly distracting because the, ca- the cats appear to be drawing curtains behind us and having a row. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, so this this is kind of the topic that has inspired... I don't know if you can hear that shriek. (laughs) I'm going to go and break up the cats. Yeah. (laughs) There actually is a cat fight going on in the hall. So the news story that inspired this this podcast was, in fact, the tax-dodging shenanigans of Amazon, Starbucks, Google, et al. And all of the subsequent bitching and moaning, because leaving aside the morals and ethics of tax avoidance and the fact that actually they have a legal obligation to maximise their profits and all the rest of it, I think, in fact, that the government would be better off concentrating on closing the legal loopholes because that always begs the question, you know, you're a private citizen. Would you pay more tax than you had to do? Joe, 
you're a private citizen. Would you pay more tax than you legally had to, out of the goodness of your heart? Well, I'm a PAYE kind of tax simple guy, and I have never volunteered to just put some more money in the tax man's pocket. No, of course you haven't. If, you, if you're taking it to the libertarian extreme, it's legalised theft anyway. Easy now. <laughs> But yeah, so, you know, I, I think that would be better off closing the loopholes and working out a system that keeps the big companies here because it's good for UK PLC. Yeah, it's a question of balancing the, the, the company's incentive to stay here versus the government's benefits from them doing so. Yeah. But the, the thing that gets me, I think that the, the reason that big companies do this is because they're totally removed from the human side of it. There's There's not one person in charge of this stuff. So it's not like somebody who has to look themselves in the mirror it's it's a department and so it's nobody's problem really and you've got all of these systems cats are going mental in the background doing my fucking head in is what they're doing Wh- whiskey I, I found whiskey halfway up the curtains so yeah i think it would actually be better if there was one person in charge of this stuff because i think they'd have to look themselves in the mirror and they'd find it very difficult to tax dodge basically because i couldn't look myself in the eye every day if i was if i was dodging tax Yes, I don't pay more than I have to, but, but, if, but I, but I pay were, my share. Yeah, if you were wrangling it so that you didn't pay what you should. Yeah, I, I don't think I could live with myself with that. It would really, it would, it would. It, I'm not that kind of person. I don't think you are either, and I don't think that most people are. But when you put these corporate fences in the way, it removes it removes that sense of responsibility of people from mm. people. Anyway, leaving all that aside, the thing that really got me about this is I heard somebody whinging and moaning on. Um, one of the Radio 4 shows, I think it was Any Answers, about how these big companies that are dodging taxes are destroying small independent businesses and putting them out of business. And I just wanted to say that that is utter bullshit. Does my head in. It's okay. whinging and moaning entitlement attitude that because I run a business and because I work hard, somehow the world owes me a living. Right. And somehow because I work hard and I'm a small business, I'm I'm more entitled to customers and lots of money than somebody like Amazon and Starbucks, who, by the way, started off as tiny businesses, because mm-hmm. everybody does. So rather than blaming big business for all their struggles, I think these, which is a massive waste of time and energy, they should get off their fat asses and fix it, because there's plenty of stuff that you can do. And talking about companies like Amazon, because they're one of the ones who are being bitched and moaned at by by the small independent businesses. Let's take Persephone Books as an example. Do you remember when we went to Persephone Books a couple of years ago? I've been there a couple of times, I think. I've been there a couple of times. Little independent bookseller in London. Mm-hmm. They specifically aim their books at women and they publish books by women, for women. And their books are, they tend to be by um, lesser known female authors of people who have been perhaps overlooked. Mm-hmm. And the, the books are lovely. I've got a few of them. and they're, they're, They, they buy, print them and bind them themselves, don't they? They do. They print them and bind them themselves, and they bind them beautifully. So they're beautifully bound in these kind of blue-grey covers, kind of semi-hardback. They're not quite hardback, but they've got dust jackets. And then inside, they're kind of covered with, with a, a fabric from the era, because a lot of them are, are kind of war era. And mm. there's, there's some a beautiful book of short stories set around the, the First World War that I've got that's just delightful. Anyway, they come with the dust jacket and all the beautiful bindings and they all look similar, so they would make a really nice collection in a kind of old-fashioned library. And they each come with a bookmark as well. Mm-hmm. And so they're missing a trick here because you can, you can... I mean, you can go to your shop, the shop, and you can buy them and you can mail order them and you can join a club and get a book a month sent to you or something, which is really cool. But what else could they do? I mean, they don't, they don't really appeal to you because they're nice, but they're not a blokey thing, are they? Um... Well, I've read a couple of them, but no, but the not, ones not I've been knocking around. But yeah, they're, they're, not they're not the pointed story, at me. not the story, but the packaging and the way they're marketed. Yeah, they're, they're not pointing. Uh, I am not their ideal customer. No, that's for sure. I'm probably nearer to their ideal customer, but I'm probably not quite as girly as I'd like me to be. Hmm. But what they are missing is marketing to men like you to buy them as presents for people like me. It's true. Because that would be great. You could, you know. A, there's like hundreds of books in their catalogue. Oh, yeah, I've been in their shop a couple of times. They've never got my address. I wouldn't mind if they had it and pointed some stuff at me once in a while. Yeah, and some of the stuff they do right is they send a proper magazine every quarter, and it's it's not just like a catalogue. It's a proper literary magazine, which is a really good read because I, I read it when it comes in. They send it with a catalogue. It's it's nice. But then you know you could take it a step further and say, okay, well you've got all these beautiful books. How about a bookcase to put them in? 
Mm. that could quite easily upsell a lot of people on a really beautiful bookcase you know really craft craftsmanship handmade kind of yeah kind of bookcase but they don't do that i think it's a shame what about stationery yeah writing sets that kind of thing so that's a way that and you know these guys are obviously making some money because they've got i think they used to have their office in bloomsbury which is not a cheap area of london and now their office is in it was quite a trendy area of london wasn't it i can't remember i have no idea so Persephone could be a rival to Amazon if they really wanted to be. And, you know, maybe they don't. Maybe they're making plenty of money. I don't know. But there are other things that they could do. Abe Books is another example. Abe Books is A-B-E Books, by the way. And they sell rare and secondhand and first editions and that kind of thing. And they're an online bookseller as well. And I get an email from them maybe once a week. Mm-hmm. And I don't buy that much stuff from them. But if they emailed me every day... With suggestions. You'd buy a lot more of them. Hell yeah. I'm terrible for books. It's like bloody crack for me. <laughs> How many books have I got sitting behind you, Joe? Nearly all of the books. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly all of the books. The stack is up to the edge of the sofa, and now the second stack is halfway up that. We're not quite at the point where we have to tunnel through books to get places, but it's it's not that far off. <laughs> it's not that far off. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to having the library in the new house. The library. <gasps> in the new house. New house. Oh, my God. Do the listeners know about that yet? I don't know. They, they, some of them might. Some of them might. If they're paying attention. Are you paying attention? Because mm. we put an offer in on a dingle last week and pretty much, well, it was this time. Ah, oh, Right now we're recording this on Wednesday, the 10th of February. And it was Thursday, the ever it was last week of February, the 4th of February. That they accepted it. That they accepted our offer. So yes, very, very, very exciting. Anyway, I need I need a library, basically. Yeah. Well, you can have a library. Yeah, Bring I will. Room. Got some space. Going to fill it with books from a books. But my point is, I buy quite a lot of books from Amazon. Why do I buy books from Amazon? Because they will deliver it to me the next day. Hmm. They will make suggestions based on what I, they make my life easy. And you're lazy. You're and I'm, a lazy customer. I'm a lazy customer. Every every customer is a lazy customer, Joe. Mm. Everybody wants their life to be easier. And I would much rather give my money to a small independent bookseller. And I do. I do buy stuff from a books every now and then. But I would rather spend a lot more money with them. Because I would pay more to buy from them than I do from Amazon. Yeah. If they would make my life easy. As easy as Amazon. So it's utter rot that you can't compete if you're a small independent local business. That you can't compete with the big businesses. You can. You, you just have to... You just have to try, and you have to do it better, and you have to find your niche and, yeah, and get in there. absolutely you do. And when you find the people that are right for you, they won't mind paying extra. They genuinely won't. I was talking about this. Well, I was I was uh, thinking about this for fitness professionals yesterday, hmm. for, a, for a client of mine, and how people could go high-end. And I came up with the concept of, <laughs> I came up with the concept, and I think this is amazing, I should patent this or something, but I came up with the concept of a fitness butler. Wouldn't that just be awesome? Tell the good listener what a fitness <laughs> butler does. <laughs> okay, so how shit am I at getting out of bed? You are shite at getting out of bed. I'm dreadful. I basically have to make tea and then drag you out by your heels. Yeah, it's, it's really awful. The thing is, I love being up once a month, but I'm dreadful at getting out of bed. Rubbish. I'm, I get that from my dad, he's terrible at getting out of bed as well. That's an excuse. Possibly. <laughs> I'm sure it's genetic. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. But yes, I am terrible at getting up. I also would like to be better at running and I also would like to be able to do the splits. And also I'm very, very lazy. I'm totally motivated to go to my circus class and my pole classes because they tend to be in the evening. They're really good fun. You've got up by then. And I've got got, got up by then, yeah. (laughs) I've got up by then. But if I was a rich person, I would happily pay somebody an absolute bucket of money to drag me out of bed by the hair at like half past five in the morning and make me go running for an hour or you know do my flexibility stuff or turn up at my at my office at lunchtime and make me do half an hour's worth of flexibility yeah splits training and i'm not going to do that because i haven't that much money to burn well it wouldn't be burning it'd be a good investment but you know if i was training for marathons and wanted to do ultra marathons and things which i think is bonkers but you know a marathon i might do one day Hmm. I would, I would really like to have somebody to basically bully me into it. You'd pay and quite a lot for that. I would pay a lot for that if I could afford it. But there are, the, the point is, there are people out there who would pay a lot for that. But not just that. We're not just talking about a fitness professional here. We're talking about making yourself completely unique. So, you know, what else could you do for people? Could you go into their kitchen? You could cook. You could shop. You could throw all of the diet coke out. You could make sure it's full of vegetables and good things with recipes. And you can... 
all of that good stuff. Make sure they're eating properly and exercising properly and drag them out of bed and make them do it. Yeah, exactly. Rich people pay a lot of money for that. So there you go. And we've got this little ski and sports shop near us in Leamington as well called Lockwoods, which is awesome. And we spent quite a lot of money in there. Great little shop. Great little shop. And easily their prices are, what, 10, 15% more expensive than um, somewhere like Go Outdoors? Yes, for sure. But you get somebody there who will measure your feet, like old-fashioned. Do you remember when you were a kid and you used to go and get your feet measured? Yeah, not with those big x-ray machines that gave you cancer, though. What? Did you not ever put your foot in one of those big, green, bony, skeleton x-ray frightening things? No. Oh, check it out, man. They, they were terrifying. Okay. You put your foot in a box and then they x-rayed it and then they gave you a picture of your... Because you, you put your whole sh- your foot in the shoe and then you put your shoe in the box and then it would it would x-ray how much gap there was between your toes and the shoe. That's that, that sounds like overkill for yeah. foot measuring. <laughs> yeah, it was. Okay. Extra services, though. Well, ex- extra services, yeah. But <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you don't need to go quite as far as an x-ray machine. Yeah. I don't know. But at Lockwoods, they will measure your feet and they'll make you walk around and they will show you not necessarily the most expensive thing, but the thing that they think is right for you. Buy my, I bought my walking boots from there. I buy my approach shoes. We get all the climbing gear from there. Yeah, if, if you go to go outdoors and say, oh, I would like a climbing harness, then some Saturday chap will kind of go, here is the shelf with the climbing harnesses. And then you buy one. Whereas if you go to Lockwoods and say, I would like a climbing harness, they will say, well, do you do traditional climbing or ice climbing or mixed climbing or sport climbing? Or what's what's your thing with climbing? Do you need this? Do you need that? Do you need adjustable leg loops? You know, what sort of size and weight are you? Do you need an alpine harness? And then they will pick out the ones that you that, that seem appropriate for, and then for they what will you need. dangle you from the ceiling. And then they'll dangle you from the ceiling for, you know, for as long as you like. And then they will come back and say, well, you know, are you comfortable? Is that all right? Have your legs gone dead? Are you, are you happy? Is your back aching? <laughs> and if, if any of the answers are, yes, my back aching or my legs hurt, they'll go, well, this is not the harness for you. And then they will go and get another one that they think is more appropriate. Which is really cool. Yeah, because they know what they're talking about. It's yeah, great. which is why we go back there. But you know what else? This is another thing that kind of gripes me a little bit because they've never once, or I think they've emailed me once in the three or four years that I've been going there. Yeah. They could get my postal address off me just by asking. I, I will buy any climbing gear widget that is newly available. Oh, if here's they, it's like a magpie. It's if, ridiculous. Oh, shiny technology for climbing and saving your life, though. You've got to have it. So if, if they if they told me, here, we've got a new thing and here's a review and maybe you want one, I'd go, yeah, I'll have one of those. Yeah. And if they emailed us, you know, every daily emails, but, you know, if they emailed me even once a week and said, oh, I've got this new thing in. Hmm. Then it'd be like, oh, and we'd pop along and yeah. probably buy it. Well, maybe if not buy it, at least have a poke. And then while we were there, I'd probably buy some gloves. Yeah, or because, a hat. Or a hat, or go poking around, because all their stuff is really nice. They don't sell cheap shit. They sell really, really good, nice stuff. But they don't invite us into the shop. They, they don't. And that, it is a mistake. I was going to say it's not a mistake, but it is a mistake. I shudder to think how much cash they're leaving on the table. Yeah. Because they could quite easily get us to spend twice as much as we do. Easily. Easily. And you know we're we're quite I don't know we're not that we're not that flagrantly spendy. It's we're, just that we're pretty well. I'm, I'm I'm pretty profligate when it comes to the climbing gear. Yeah, I, Joe's a bit like me with my books with the climbing gear, aren't you? Anything that comes along, you'll buy it. Whereas I'll be like, I need new books, and suddenly five arrive, and now we're buried in books. Yeah, just for you know those of you who aren't sure, you never want to be a couple of hundred feet up a cliff thinking. Oh, I I really should have bought a slightly cheaper piece of equipment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish I'd saved a couple of quid on that because this thing's just just too expensive. <laughs> never yeah. happens. Never. It's like we we both ride motorbikes as well, and we we would hear people say, "Oh, where can where can I get a cheap motorcycle helmet from?" And it's like, well, what the you f- what? Are you kidding? <laughs> What? what? Or somebody that says, I saw this, this really cool motorcycle helmet on eBay and it was only 50 quid and it was second hand. It's like, what? <laughs> are you mental? Yeah. And th- Oh, God, people are crazy. So, for, how much is your head worth? Seriously. It's an old question, but it's a good one. It is a good one. Sometimes the cliches are the best. Oh, and garages. Garages is another thing. One of my least favourite things in the world is dealing with car maintenance. I don't mind poking around in engines on a nice day and kind of learning how stuff works. But when it needs servicing, I just want it to be taken care of (laughs) because I'm busy. And dropping your car off at a garage is a pain in the arse. For no other reason than you're then left in a garage. Yeah. 
And I t- oh, I t- tried to run home once and I don't, it didn't go well. Did. Anyway, <laughs> that's a totally different story. But yeah, if a garage could, A, remind me when it's due for a service, because I never remember that shit. It's boring and I don't mm-hmm. remember it. Remind me that when it's due for a service, call me and say, here are three slots, which one would you like? And I will choose one. And then they turn up, take my car away, leave me with a courtesy car and bring my car back either the next day or later on that day or whenever. Yeah. Just let me know what's being done. I would happily pay a premium for that service because it means that I'm not wasting my time faffing around. And the only reason you don't have that service is because nobody has asked you whether you would like it. Exactly. Which is mental because I would... So many people would pay that. and Not even rich people. I'm not... I'm by no means a rich person, not even close to it. But I, I am a very busy person and I'm far more better, far more better. Far more better. <laughs> far, I'm far, more, far better. more better with the words. Far more better with the words, with, with the writing of the words to making the money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm far better spending my time on stuff that will bring money in for me. Yeah, than trogging to and from garages. Too right. Yeah. So. I agree. Yeah, totally missing So if any of you out there run prestige garages that just look after cars and more importantly, look after the people who own the cars, yeah. then get in touch because we'll give you money. Yeah. And also add on a, a full valet. Clean my car inside and out. Mm. Like completely inside and out. Make it real, you know, a real good job. I'll pay, include that in. Or even get me to pay monthly. I would pay at a garage 20 quid a month or, you know, how I don't know, however much it works out to be. But, you know, however much a month for them to... Come and collect it from me, take it away and service it, valet it completely, bring it back, leave me with a courtesy car, remind me when it's due and do the make, whole Make sure your MOT thing. never runs out. Make sure my MOT never runs out. Replaces things and includes, say, I don't know, one medium-sized thing a year that needs <laughs> fixing. Thing. Yeah. I don't know, maybe maybe you get like a certain amount of money in the kitty from this that, that will cover a certain amount of... Yeah. I don't know, but there, there is, you know... Somebody, I would, somebody who owns a garage should put that together and sell it to you. Yeah, it's a continuity product, an amazing continuity product that a lot of people would take advantage of because it's a small amount of money a month that you, you don't have to think about. You and, never get hit with a bill, big, unexpected, frightening bill. Yeah, because that's the other thing. It comes to car servicing time and suddenly it's like 300 quid at once, which isn't an enormous amount of money, but <laughs> I would rather spread it over a year. Yeah, and be assured that I don't. I'm not going to forget about it. And you know, and if they could, oh god, if they could remind me that my insurance is due and that kind of thing, and the tax, yeah, sort the tax out for me as well, because that's a pain in the ass. Well, it's not really anymore. You just do it online, but but it's a pain in the ass when you just stuff the letter in a pile and then you forget about it for a couple of weeks and then you, you... realise you're two weeks overdue and you think I need to do this now or somebody's yes. going to catch me. <laughs> Blue lights start following you around. Up. <laughs> not good. So yeah. So I, you know, this this podcast I reckon is thousands and thousands of pounds worth of information for people if they apply it to their business. How can you make yourself stand out instead of, you know, instead of moaning about the state of the economy or the state of the market? Get out there and make a difference. Hmm. Do, do something. something do something delightful. Delight your delight your clients. And it's not the case that this garage needs to have all of its customers on this massively expensive continuity scheme that just takes care of everything. No. Some of them. So that could be an option for people. That could be an option, yeah. And there can be a lower level that just looks after the maintenance, and there can be a level below that that just makes sure you you always get the slot when you need it and then they can be they can they can tier it and they yeah. can price it accordingly but always go deluxe because there are going to be people with rolls royces and db9s who will pay a couple of hundred quid a month to make sure that you treat their car like real nice like real nice yeah and you know that they're, they're people whose cars are their pride and joy whereas i love my car but it's a little bit rusty it's kind of rusting on the drive yeah anyway so there you go that's um I, what's my, what's my message uh, deluxe go deluxe Go to looks. Think about continuity schemes. Delight people. Where can you make a difference? How can you entice people away from the big companies? Keep talking to them. Offer them stuff. Yeah. All of that All of that good stuff. Yeah, there's, there's loads of things. All of which, by the way, I teach my Inner Circle members how to do. So there you go. Businessforsuperheroes.com forward slash inner hyphen circle. Or if that's a step too far, business, businessforsuperheroes.com and buy my fucking book. Really? Is that a link? Yeah. Buy my fucking book. <laughs> no. <laughs> Slash by my fucking... It should be. Oh, I might make it a link. It's yeah. not the moment, but yeah. Business for, for superheroes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, same time next week. Okay. But there'll be no Joe next week. What, what? Joe's looking worried what, now. What? What? <laughs> hey? Um, I'm interviewing Ollie Luke. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, he's he a is, good guy. He is a good guy. He's a northern monkey marketing, copywriting type dude. And he very kindly agreed to do an email, uh, an email, an interview with me. Okay. And so we're going to be talking about the three steps to discovering the hidden profits in your business. Three steps for discovering the hidden profits in your business. Yep. I've already given you a whole bunch of steps today, by the way, because there's a million ideas there for you. But Ollie is going to go through some actual practical kind of gubbins. Slightly less chaotic. Yeah. Less chaotic. Slightly less ranty. Sneeze coming up, folks. Okay. So... Have a splendid week, guys. Thanks for listening. And, well, I'll see you same time next week, and Joe will see you in a couple of weeks' time. I'll, I'll just be hiding in the kitchen or something. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Like what you've just heard? Tell your colleagues. Tell your friends. Send them to www.businessforsuperheroes.com slash podcast. <laughs>